I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm glad to know I'm saved. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Good morning, Sister Lucy. How are you? Hallelujah. Um, God is good. Joshua chapter 5 and verse 11. Joshua 5 and 11. It's good to be in the house of God. Amen. And we're going to, if, if that, whatever they're doing on a heater, if it don't get to work, and I'm going to preach fast, y'all better listen fast. I'm going to let you out of here. Hey, I'm the one getting to move around, jump around, and, and I'm going to be warm, but I know you're going to be cold, and I'm going to do my best to, to move it along this morning, and, and, um, and that's okay. We will survive. Amen? Verse 11, And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow. After the Passover, unleavened cakes and parched corn in the selfsame day. And the manna ceased. Everybody say, and the manna ceased. On the morrow, and after they had eaten of the old corn of the land, neither had the children of Israel manna any more. But they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. We ask you to move in this place, Lord. We ask you to help us. Give us strength, Lord, in your word. And everybody said amen. You may be seated this morning. I'm excited about the Lord. The Lord just, just does great things. Amen? But let me, let me just... Uh, there, there's something that goes on in the, in the power of God's plan as that He moves things from one thing to another. He never keeps us in the same place for very long. Thank God for that. Amen? We move from faith to faith, from blessing to blessing, from learning and understanding on through to greater understanding. He never keeps us in one place. Everything that He created on the face of the earth was intended to grow up and mature. How would y'all like to be? You know, I, I've told this story around here before. I'll, I'll just tell it again. A preacher friend of mine, his son was caught in the girls' dormitory. Just stripped naked with a pair of boots on. Clomping down the hallway. He was only a year and a half to two years old. It was cute. It was funny. That's because he was immature. If he'd have been 14 or 15, we'd have had a whole different problem. You see, there are things that we go through as a young person in God, as a, as a babe in Christ, as a coming to God, as, as learning of God, that we grow out of. Thank the Lord. Hallelujah for that. Amen? How many of you are glad that you have a better understanding today of the greatness of God than what you did when you first came to God? You see, the children of Israel didn't have much of an understanding of God. But when they came out of Egypt going unto the promised land, God began to feed them divinely from heaven's throne. The Bible says they did eat angels' food. Whatever you want to call manna, that's what they had to eat day in and day out. They got up in the morning and they went out of their little tent and they gathered together enough of the manna for them for the day, for their entire family. All they had to do was get up and go get it and come in and eat it and have breakfast, lunch, and dinner of the manna. God at different times provided meat and other things, but daily, every day, six days a week, the manna came. If you wanted to get greedy and take three or four pots of it, it would ruin by morning. If you didn't get out there by a certain time to get it, it would ruin before you got it. But tomorrow, it would be back again. You know, this was so common. Something a lot of people haven't thought about. It was so common that there was an entire generation of people that didn't know anything different. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, an entire generation did all... I mean, where does your food come from? Well, you get up and go to Walmart, you go here, you go there. These people just rolled out of bed, walked out, picked it up off the ground, went in and ate it. God just supplied it. Man, you know what? God does that. He'll supply that kind of life for you. He will bring it into your hands. If you'll live for Him and walk for Him, it will be just that easy. But then you don't understand. That's a tough life, man. I'm going to tell you, I do understand. But I'm going to tell you what, I also understand God provides. He does make a way. And if somebody's willing to walk with Him, serve Him, seek Him, let Him guide them, God will bring everything unto them. It ain't always going to be perfect. It ain't always going to be bright and sunny shot up. Sometimes you're going to have to scramble your eggs. Amen? 
Sometimes somebody scrambles my eggs for me. Uh, you know, it's just one of things. But, but here they are. But it said that the manna ceased. It's got to be scary. Frightening. To think about the manna. This thing that has been provided to you day in and day out just stopped. One day we got up and there was manna. And the next day there wasn't. God has let me down. Oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know where I'm going to get help from. I don't know. I don't know. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If He provided yesterday, He'll provide today. And He'll provide forever. You see, God brings things into our life that sometimes have got to be burned away in order for us to mature. You see, whenever you're going through the wilderness and you're going through situations in life and God has not yet brought you into a rest, He provides for you in such a way that it is sitting on your doorstep. But there comes a point in time where the maturity comes in, where you have stepped into what was called the rest. Canaan land was the rest. Canaan land was the place they were to go to to be at rest with God. And God had a different provision for Canaan than He did for the wilderness. You see, when your provision changes, whether it's provision of food or finances or provision of spiritual understanding or whatever it might be, sometimes God has growth and the provision way and the methods change from time to time. And when you're maturing with God, it's not always easy to have that change. If you don't believe me, just look at these kids. They go to school in kindergarten, it's all about crayons and coloring and singing and clapping your hands. Man, they do good to sit in a semicircle and listen to the teacher read a book about whatever. You know, Curious George or whatever. Man, come to fifth grade, my God, I'm fixing to go to sixth grade. I don't know about what they do around here, but sixth grade in Florida, we started changing classes. And, and uh, I mean, it was just, and when you walked in there, Miss Bond expected you to be sitting at your desk with your pencil out and ready. And oh my goodness, this is crazy. I'm getting knowledge. I'm maturing. But the way it comes about has a change in my life. You know, unfortunately, I didn't quite get that change in English class and I kind of slept through it. That's why I can't read and write today. Well, I can read and write, just nobody can understand it. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> so thank God for computers. I don't know what we do without Microsoft. It's just a beautiful thing. But we've got, it, it, you know, that begin to change. My, my understanding begin to change. You know, we have the kids back there in Sunday school, and it's fun, but, you know, we move them from the class to class as they grow up and as they mature. It's a little different. That The lessons are a little bit stronger, a little bit deeper, a little bit more intense. And then, my God, you've got to come to pastor's class. It's horrible. How many of y'all would rather be back there coloring? I know. Okay, thank you, Brother Trill. At least I'm not the only one. But we have a difficult thing whenever maturing takes effect. Maturing in the Holy Ghost, maturing in understanding in God, as God begins to bring into our lives on a different level, a different method, a different transition. I was thinking on this message, and I, I passed by it three or four days in a row and didn't get it. Anybody ever done that? Look at stare something right smack dab in your eye, and it's like it fits perfectly, but then oh well. But you see... There was, you know, I don't know, anybody ever been around uh, cane fields beside me? Sugar cane? Man, I, oh, I can't make it up then. Somebody else has been there. But I, you know, if you were to raise your hand, I could just make up all kinds of stuff. But truthfully, sugar cane, I, I grew up around it all my life. And down in South Florida, it just sits, it grows in that black, black dirt soil that's so, that's so beautifully rich. And it just, it grows tall. And Louisiana, same way. Just big old, I mean, you know, you walk out there. If, if someone dropped you in the middle of a sugar cane field, you wouldn't even be sure if it was daylight or dark. You wouldn't be sure if it was, uh, you couldn't get your way out if you tried. Well, because it's so thick. You see, uh, what most people think of sugar cane as, as just this stalk of, 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 you know, about yay big around. It grows up about seven foot tall and acts about as big as it gets and as much you understand about it. But sugar cane grows up and there's all kind of flurry stalks of grass all over it. 
It's like sawgrass. It, it's, it's thick, it's burly, it's, it's, it, 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 and it grows in clumps because they just throw out pieces of sugar cane and it, it seeds off of that. It grows up and it'd be clumps of it. And, and it's real, you know, it's, 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 you couldn't harvest it like that if you tried. So what they do is they go out there and they light it on fire. And it begins to burn away all of the trimmings from the stalk. And it, it, I mean, it will turn up a black smoke that you can see from many, many miles away. And it has a smell that you can smell. I mean, there's just something about that smell of that cane burning. Man, it just, it'll fill your ears, your nose, not your ears, but it'll fill your nose. And, and it don't always smell too good, but it's always real ripe. I can remember living in, in Belle Glade, Florida, or passing up down the uh, Highway 27 through all the sugarcane fields and just smelling that. you a long ways away. And, and, but you see, you've got to burn it to get down to the good stuff. If you don't burn it, harvesting it's a horrible thing. I mean, it just would be impossible. In the old times, they got you with a, just nothing more than a machete. And they burn that stuff and they just walk on and whack. And they drop them stalks over and lay them flat. And then they come along with a cart back in the old days. And they would pick them up on that cart. And they'd want them all laying in one row. And, but you know, you can't get to that sweet stuff until you have a fire come. Until you have a burning, a purging, a cleansing fire that makes a difference. You see, there is something about the Holy Ghost when it grows on the inside of you, it begins to burn some things out of our life. It begins to burn some old man. It begins to burn some old things. Corinthians tells us that all things are passed away and behold, all things become new. You see, when the Holy Ghost and fire sets a lump on the inside of us, some things begin to change. I'm excited about that change today, but it's not always, don't always feel good. I don't know about y'all, but I'm feeling some heat going on. Is, that, is it getting better in here? But I don't know, maybe I'm just preaching about the fire and I'm feeling it. That's okay. But when the Holy Ghost comes in, it begins to, to break down our natural resistance and our natural protection and, and all the things that protects that stalk growing up is all them bushes around it and it keeps stuff away from it so it grows to maturity so that it produces seed so that it produces an offspring but it's got to be burned away in order to get to the good stuff there are some things in our life that protects us, that, that surrounds us, that compasses us on every side that God sometimes sends a wind of fire to burn through us so they will produce cleanliness inside of us so that the next thing can happen in our life. The children of Israel, it would have been nice to get up every day. Or I'm sure it was nice to get up every day and just go out and get your manna. But you were a nobody. You were just a passer through. You were just something on the, you know, on the landscape. You, you were not established as anything. We're not established sometimes in the graces of God until we've had a purging. You know, in a big, big forest, if they don't burn up the trash that grows at the base of the trees, eventually you have a forest fire and it burns the trees. It's not easy to go along somewhere and see a horrible fire burning up all the palm brushes. South Florida has this. They, they have big, big fires that just, just rush through there and they burn up all these dry brushes underneath these tr big old trees and, and it, it, it scorches the trees but you go look back and look about a year or so later and those trees have grown five and six foot higher and bigger and wider and they look beautiful and they're majestic and all of that but there came a fire through there and it just cleaned out all of the underbrush. And let me tell you something. That's some scary stuff when you see it. There's some scary things in your life when God begins to burn the underbrush of your life. When God begins to cut away some things. When God begins to prune your life and make it ready for the next happening and the next move of God that's provided in your life that God is bringing you to. He doesn't want you to struggle. He, doesn't want, he wants to establish you in some things. He wants to bring you to a place where you can get up every morning and not open the door of your tent but open the door of your house. And it's not easy when you get up that first day and guess what? There ain't no more manna. Oh my goodness, that's all I've ever known. But God, but God's still there. God doesn't leave. God doesn't change. Nothing ever is ever undone. He is still God. He was able to provide the manna. He's able to provide what you need in your world today. He's able to take you into greater understanding of the Holy Ghost. You see, sometimes our mind gets blocked by the stuff, the crustaceans. 
You know, I grew up, my first job, I worked at a yacht factory. And down in South Florida, there was a lot of, a lot of, lot of work going on in boats and yachts and, and ships and stuff. And they, there's, there's work for, if you want to be a diver, there, there's good work for you. You go out there to the diver, and, and you could dive on the side of these ships, and you get a scraper, and you scrape those barnacles off that ship. You see, these things grow up on us, like a tick on a dog. It happens. And the more you get on you, the more, or not, maybe that's the wrong English, the slower you go. I started to say the more slower. That ain't, that ain't the right way to say it. But the slower you go. Sometimes, you know, you got out there and it was just a roar, a roar and everything else. All of a sudden, things doesn't feel too good to have that scraper run down the side of you. And just like, just, you just feel, you're so attached to the things that are slowing you down. You're so attached to the, to the lessons in life that you've learned up until this point. That may or may, you know, they're right. Nothing wrong with them. Praise God, bless God, a pastor would just preach Acts 2.38. And man, we just, we'd be, that'd be all we need. Really? You know what, we need to learn, and, I, and you know, I, I hope I do better than that. I'm, nothing wrong with that, but there's a level that we go through. There, man, it used to be excitement, but we get deeper into the Word of God. We get more understanding. You know why? Because your trial tomorrow is going to be deeper. Your problem the next week is going to be bigger. Your situations you're going to go through, you're going to have to learn to trust in God more tomorrow than you did today. But guess what? God will still be there tomorrow just like He is today. He will not let you down no matter what comes up. But all you've got to do is begin to grow in Him and allow that fire to purge you and allow it to cleanse you. You see, when you come to the altar and you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, there is a flaming fire that moves through your life. And all of a sudden, the things that have been around you and compassing you. They begin to fall away from you. Give an opportunity for the sun of the light of God to shine upon your life and to expose you to the greatness of His wonderful nature and His love and His kindness and the genuine sincerity in which He died on the cross for you. That's what it means to receive the Holy Ghost. That's what it means to be purged with the Word of God. Amen. There is a pine cone for the Oh, forget it. It's some kind of, obviously a pine tree. Jack pine. Yep, that's it. For the jack pine tree. And it is weird because all pine cones, when they fall away, they kind of start, when they dry, they begin to open. There is a key factor in almost every seed-bearing plant that produces that opening that reveals the seed. This particular pine cone is unique. Do you know that there are some seed-bearing trees that never drop their seed until the host or the mother plant dies? That's weird, ain't it? It just holds that seed in until it dies. And then it releases it. A Malaluca tree in Florida, they, they brought them over here many years ago and they pretty much dried up most of the Everglades because they consumed so much water. And they're, they're paper. You can peel the bark, it's just literally paper. That's, that's, that's the best way to describe it. But if you cut it down, it will release several hundred thousand seeds at once, just poof, into the air to protect its species. Well, the jack pine tree has a unique pine cone that when it falls, it does not open. And the scientists did not understand what was going on for many years until after a flame and a fire burned up through a wilderness area and those jack pine pine cones began to burst open letting seed fall. You see, that's what happens to our life a lot of times. Whenever the Holy Ghost comes moving on to us, all of a sudden there is an opening and the seed of the Word of God begins to go forth. You know, I don't want to wait till I'm dead and gone to have the seed of the Word of God go forth. I want it to go forth now. As I grow, I want to spread bigger seed, better seed. As the Lord matures me, I want to be able to reproduce myself with more maturity, with more understanding, with more knowledge. I want God to use me in greater ways. I don't want to be stuck in the realm that I'm in. God, burn it up. Destroy it. Do what you got to do. I want to move from here. Let the manna cease and let me step into Canaan land and eat of the fruit of Canaan land this year. I'm ready for God to begin to flourish some things in my life. 
God wants to bring us out. And God wants to use us and God wants to do great things to us. Don't be afraid of the fire. Don't be afraid when things begin to dry up around you and God begins to purge you from some things. It's a sign of maturity. It's a sign of transition. It's a sign of growing up in God. It's a sign of doing more for God than ever before. A lot of times... Our, 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 our nature is to hole up and be separate and be... Uh, but, you know, all of a sudden we find ourselves becoming unified with others. Let me tell you something. Let that old nature pass away. Why? Because if we're going to make it to heaven, if we're going to multiply and we're going to do the work of God, it's going to be because we're unified together. That we're together in mind and body and peace and the Holy Ghost and everything else that's good. God wants to bring us to a greater understanding. And I need to ask God every day, Lord, let the manna cease. The things, Lord, that have been just kind of casually in my life. You see, when we are at uh, this, this infant stage, everything kind of just comes to us. But when we begin to mature, we start taking ourselves to it. But God brings it. So you have to plant the wheat. So you have to thresh the wheat. So you have to do this. Guess what? God provides the multitude. God provides the increase every day. And if you'll believe in Him and trust in Him, it will not be long until that which you feared not having in your life will be a memory of the past that you thank God for. But you're so glad that you moved from that place and went on to somewhere else. God wants to take us somewhere else today. He wants to take us to greater things. He wants to take us to greater understanding. He wants you to mature in Him. There are some things, said Paul said, when I was a child, I spake as a child. But when I became a man, I put away my childish things. Somebody said, Brother Dunn, you need to do that. Well, that may be true. But let me tell you something. God has brought us to a place and He's taken us further. Further and further and further. The greater our relationship with Him is, the closer we get to Him, the greater the understanding, the greater the blessing. I'm glad that God has taken me from where I was to where I am. How about you? Are you glad? Hallelujah. Let's stand and talk to the Lord this morning. God, I'm asking you today to move amongst this church family, Lord. For as you are taking us from mercy to mercy, from faith to faith, from blessing to blessing, God, I ask you to take this church, Lord, to greater areas and greater understanding, God. I'm asking you, Lord, to give us strength and under help and, and to help our minds, Lord, that we would receive more of you. God, I ask you to go with each and every one of us, Lord, today. Be peace unto our lives, Lord. Let us not be afraid of the fire, but let it burn through our lives and let it take the immaturity of our old ways and give us unto grace and unto understanding, Lord. Plant a seed of love. Plant a seed of the gospel upon our hearts. And we thank you for it today. You're such a great big God. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. amen. Real quick, before I dismiss you, I want to say something that's on my heart this morning. And I have... Um, been troubled by this, but many, many people are troubled by the whole situation in Connecticut this last week. And I'm going to say something that may be difficult to say, but we're more concerned about it because it's children. First of all, that's where we have to un misunderstand God a little bit more. Children, to God, is a miniature adult. They're under the protection of their parents. And we need to recognize that people are people. And the saddest thing that broke my heart about that whole deal was, what, 20 kids that probably had never been taken to church, had never had their soul in a place where God could touch them. And if you want to get upset about what happened, that's what you need to get upset about. Because we don't know the day nor the hour that God's going to come. But for those people, God came that day. The adults, the same situation. Where was the parents that maybe raised the adults? Would that young man that pulled the trigger have been changed had he been raised on a church pew somewhere? Not taught just to go to church, but taught to live for God. I'm going to tell you something. It ain't all perfect. Life is what it is. Life is not always easy. But let me tell you something. When we live for God, we've got a protection. We've got a hand upon us. We've got peace. We've got help. And we've got hope. Let me tell you, well, I'm, going to, I'm going to just prophesy to you. You ain't heard near the end of it. There's a lot more to come. Because the Lord showed us over and over and over again in the Word of God.
people that fought against the kingdom of God, he turned them one upon another and they killed themselves. And the Lord spoke that to me. And it's going to move, you be, just like I said, you may as well get ready for it. Because it's going to move from one area to another area. People, as, as this world begins to have the, the thumb of the Lord pressed down upon it because of the iniquity of the spiritual righteousness of this people, God's going to put it on them. I'm going to tell you what, it ought to bring, make you so much more stalwart in your walk with God. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to help my kids live for God. I'm going to, because this world is wicked. And this world is receiving the wrath of God right now. Because it hates God. So I don't, I, I no problem if you want to be crying for kids being lost. That's, that's no problem. But more so cry for their soul. Because let me tell you something, three years old or 300 years old, they are going to answer. They're going to answer. I want to get to heaven. I want to see my kids get to heaven. I want to see your kids get to heaven. I want us all to walk on those streets of gold and make a difference in the kingdom of God. I want to win souls today. Amen? Somebody want to win a soul before, somebody, before they're lost? We need to get a hunger for souls so bad that you can't eat up with it. Why? That's what's going to change this world. That's what's, Revival is going to change this world. And when we fall in love with the souls of man, we'll fight for them, we'll pray for them, and God will bless this nation if we'll have revival. And it can start with us. Hallelujah. God is good.